another E3 has come and gone. And as per pretty much every other time we've had done an E3 since I've started breaking it all down, it's time to give my thoughts on the E3 that was. And I even have notes and everything, just like every other year. So, now, this year was kind of lighter in some of the gameplay stuff in the past few years. Um, probably for a lot of reasons. One, I noticed the appointment-related gameplay footage that we've been seeing, there's a little less of it that have been coming out. Um, partly because I, I feel like there's like a bit of a hesitation on when the next wave of, uh, of, of over the like the games that are coming out for the next console generation that are actually intended for that generation because you want to show too much both because the yardstick is different I would say um the yardstick are, but the, the goalposts I would say are are they're not different but they're shifting um we've got a bit from Microsoft a bit from Nintendo not Nintendo but a bit from uh, Sony or E3, but not too much. I feel like when we, like, next year's E3, if we have an E3 next year, hopefully we have an E3 next year, we will see a lot more information about the new consoles, and with that, we'll see a lot more information on the games that are coming out with them and are trying to take advantage of their functionality. That said, we have plenty of good games that, uh, this year. I have eight games in particular that caught my attention. Like, these are the big ones. There are a bunch of other games that made me go, huh. But these are the ones like, yeah. So, and, and as always, these are in no particular order. I also have a couple titles which have me on the fence or a little grumbly. And I'll get into that at the tail end as well. So, 10 games total. 10 games from E3 which caught my attention. Number one, Cyberbug 2077. Partially, like, I mean, I was already into this game. I was already kind of interested in this game. And then they just kind of blew me away further with the unveiling of Keanu Reeves. And learning later that, that Keanu Reeves is... Really, I'm, really I'm not too familiar with the setting and the universe of our Telzorian games' as cyberpunk role-playing games universe. Um, but having him um, Keanu Reeves playing Johnny Silverhand, a major character in the setting... Um, major NPC kind of blew me away. And he's not, and furthermore, as interviews and more information has come out, learning that he's not a one-off, that this isn't a one-off short hop appearance. This isn't uh, the sort of Bethesda-style stunt casting of, oh, we got Patrick Stewart for like 10 minutes of oblivion. We got Lee, um, Liam Neeson for maybe 20, 30 minutes total of Fallout 3. No. Like, he's the second most heavily voiced, he's voicing the second most heavily voiced character in the game. I mean, yes, maybe Keanu is, what he's asking for is less than what Liam Neeson and what is asking for and what um, Patrick Stewart are asking for, but still, that's not nothing. That said, I mean, there's also the kind of weird, so weird, are they milkshake ducking? Are they not saga? Of you have of the possibly transphobic ad, but then CD Projekt Red giving out and saying, "Oh, we are like no, your character in the game can be trans can be transgender. We are having other transgender characters in the environment. This is just what comes up in this one vertical slice of the game." Um, so. We'll see how that aspect of the game pans out. If they, if they aren't gross about it, like, if they do a good job of kind of recovering from this and don't, don't implement transgender characters or gender fluid characters in a way where they, where they claim they're being progressive, but they're actually doubling down on being regressive, then I'm cool. We'll see how this pans out. Number two, Empire of Sin. This is a strategy game and tactical, um, and also tactical strategy game uh, set during Prohibition. It's from Paradox and is designed by the Romeros, uh, John and Brenda. And 
in case you didn't figure out about like the number of gangster films and stuff I've reviewed on my show, I need to I need to step some into film into the nineteen twenties uh, gangster films in here as well. But I, I this is a genre of cinema that I enjoy, and we and I re- I had and have read tons of books about like nineteen twenties gangsters and stuff, and I was in middle school and high school um, for wanting to learn about Prohibition era for running Call of Cthulhu games, for wondering about how these sort of gangs were structured for running Shadowrun run campaigns, that sort of thing. So I've definitely dug very heavily kind of into that. And consequently, when I see depictions of, well, again, video games where you're playing gangsters, a lot of the time, like, there's a degree of strategy and maybe polit- like, not strategy, but a degree of politicking in these games, but they always tend to focus to a certain extent on the action side of things. You're playing a gangster, and so we're going to focus on the big, exciting set pieces. We're going to focus on, to put it another way, gangster games tend to focus more on the St. Valentine's Day Massacre moments, on the bits from The Godfather where the um, Polioni family is wiping out a whole bunch of its opponents in one fell swoop. That sort of thing. These big, flashy, action-oriented or violent set pieces, but which are distinct moments within the film. Within the film. Whereas if you actually pay attention to what's going on, people are talking about and that sort of thing the concept of a gangster game if you're to, to take the concept of running an organized crime family or just organized crime organization and translate it into video game form what you want is a strategy game and you want a kind of grander scale strategy game to a certain extent whereas for um And so, whereas for most games, even like getting to like earlier strategy games like Gangsters Organized Crime, they they were real real time strategy games. They didn't feel like they worked on the scale of how like the scope of how this running an organized crime family works, where everything's kind of a slow burn. For that, you want a degree of turn-based, you want a degree of abstraction because of how things are run and how things go. And we got a game kind of like this uh, back in 2013 called Amerta um, City of Gangsters, which I played. It's all right. It's okay. I can get back and play a little more. I never got around to being the campaign mode. It was kind of dry. Um, this time, it's in the other Romeros, and they're working with Paradox. You have two very accomplished game designers. Brett Romero has worked on the Wizardry series and numerous other strategy and games and RPGs. John Romero has, of course, a tremendous flair for action. And then you have Paradox, where strategy is runs through, like, like that, that's their bag, baby. I guess they've stepped into role-playing games and stuff through bringing in um, harebrained schemes uh, through have, through purchasing White Wolf in the World of Darkness. But strategy is their bag. And from Europa Universalis, um, Victoria, Stellaris, all these grand strategy games, taking that concept and putting it in a organized crime setting in the 1920s during Prohibition, 20s and 30s in Prohibition, that is really interesting, and I really like to see how this game is, um, plays out, and how, how it turns out, because it could be, this could be really, really neat. Next is Control. I played most of the um, games that Remedy has put out, with like a couple of exceptions. Um, or from Max Payne on, I 
The only exceptions being I haven't played Quantum Break yet. I need to try that. And I haven't played Alan Wake American Nightmare. And I own both those games. Plenty to get around to playing those. And but I enjoyed all the games they made. And I that's re- I sought out Alan Wake because I enjoyed Max Payne so much. I know going in that Alan Wake is going to be a very different type of game from Max Payne, but that's fine. And the world in Max Payne in Alan Wake is very atmospheric and intense, and I loved it. And Quantum and Control is very similar, and not in the sense of oh, light and shadow and that sort of thing, but it is an very atmospheric world. It is very intense looking. It is very weird, and so I'm in. It's it feels like a weird mix of like Tales from the Flood, the sequel to Tales from the Loop, um, plus. Like the SCP files, and with the again with remedy doing shooting, plus some strength, plus some weird power traversal stuff in the game. All of this in combination has me really interested in seeing what this game feels like in my hands. Um, even if I don't end up buying it outright, at the very least, it's going to end up in my GameFly queue. The remake of Final Fantasy VII. That's my number four. I like Final Fantasy XV a lot. I like the exploration aspect of it. I like wandering around the world. I realize that with the first installment, it's going to be focused on Midgar. It's going to be the urban environments and that sort of thing. One of these big, wide, sweeping vistas, necessarily. And in fact, it's probably stiff, they're, they're probably going to heavily play up the claustrophobia of being underneath the plane. I would hope they do that. It's part of the kind of what makes Final Fantasy VII the way it is. But though the like I, I like the combat of Final Fantasy XV, which it looks like they're emulating or using outright. And I like And it looks like the combat I didn't like the magic necessarily. The magic works in Final Fantasy XV works for if you're fighting in a big open field, big wide environments where you can where you can prep your fire, your big five time casting fire spell, drop it in the middle of a grassy field and the, the grass will catch on fire and enemies in the area will take ongoing damage from the grass being on fire or you cast it in a rainy, cast ice in a, or lightning in a rainy field um, or feel after a rainstorm, or enemies are charging through a puddle, that sort of thing. Um, but it also heavily restricted your magic verb set. There are a lot of classic, classic Final Fantasy spells which don't show up in the game, really. Um, Bio ain't there. Um, the, like, the using protect and shell to manage spell castings and reflecting spells and that sort of thing doesn't really come up. And this also isn't helped by how Final Fantasy XV handles spell crafting by having you assemble spells using magical components. And that's kind of the tricky bit. So with Seven, we're going back to looks like to the materia system where you're attacking opponents, you're getting materia points or action or ability points or whatever, and using those to level up your skills over the course of the, ga- of the game. And that, and also in turn, when your spells and abilities are based off of a your your magic points in some manner or another. Or a cooldown or something else, as opposed to just, okay, I took these bolts, attached them to my lightning cores, and now I have a 5x lightning, or 5x lightning with poison, or 5x lightning with weak, or that, or some other debuff, that sort of thing. And so, going back to a more traditional Final Fantasy magic system while retaining the dynamic action oriented combat 
of 15 works nicely for me. Five, Jedi Fallen Order, or the Star Wars Fallen Order. Um, I came into E3 from seeing previous code. Oh, this is going to be a conventional action game. This is going to be your, it'd be like, maybe not as flashy as over, and over the top as Star Wars The Force Unleashed, but it's going to be, it's going to be linear. You know, there is some degree of non-linearity. It's going to be very kind of straightforward. It's going to have a very conventional story. Combat's probably going to be more... Like the one part I probably got right in my prediction was, oh, combat's probably going to be kind of uh, along the lines of the Arkham Batman Arkham game to some degree or another. And I'm not compl and I wasn't completely right on that, but the definitely is a more kind of counter focused with a degree of not sorry telegraphing, but in terms of uh, maybe some more noticeable visual cues for when an attack is coming because your character is a Jedi. Um, what I got seeing this from the e the EA play unveiling from descriptions from appointments and other gameplay footage that have been shown during E3. It's like Metroid meets Dark Souls in Star Wars. You have not bonfires, which is where you go to save your game, and which when you use the and level up your character, and when you use them, it causes enemies in the world to respond. The Metroid side of thing comes where there are areas in the environment that you can't traverse until you access abilities later, but you can access, you can go pretty much anywhere until you unlock, and outside of where you are blocked off by these abilities, and once you get those verbs or your those keys or what have you, you can come back and access, access those areas, and you can go from any, apparently, like through any of several possible worlds, and kind of bounce back and forth as you get new abilities or new stuff to let you unlock new areas. Combined with that with the map that highlights, you can't go here yet, but we will update the map to let you know you can go back here later when you get the verb that, or, you know, the, just, call it, just stick with verb, the verb that will unlock this door, that will let you traverse this um, obstacle, that sort of thing. That's exciting. That's also very different. Like that's different from the from what I expect from Respawn as a game developer. It's what I expect from a kind of a Star Wars game. I'm into it. And again, also I, I like Star Wars. I mean I do Legends of the Force. So yeah. So I'm into it. Not all of this is triple A games. I've got a couple smaller titles. Um Sakuna of Rice and Ruin. So I've never really gotten into the sort of knockoff, um, uh, well, you, not just knockoff, like the Harvest Moon games, the Rune Factory games, or the other games that are in that style. Sakuna of Rice and Ruin looks interesting because with the ones that have combat in them, like Stardew Valley or again, Rune Factory, they do a more conventional top-down style. Everything stays in the same camera's perspective. Whereas for Sakuna of Rice and Ruin, it's a more flashy 2D side-scrolling character action style, which catch my, catches my interest there. And on top of that, the setting is one which is we don't see that often, where we're in feudal Japan. So... Also, and female protagonist as well, on top of everything else. So that that's really engaging and interesting, and I'd like to see... And this is a game, I want to see how it plays out, how it works. But it's something where I, it's on my radar, and it's keeping my interest on that. It's a game that was also announced last year, we saw some stuff about it then, and it's further along now, and closer to U.S. release. And speaking of Japanese games from last year that are closer to U.S. release... Uh, Damon X Machina, the next game from Platinum. And Platinum, I played Bayonetta 2 this past year, and I was really impressed. I felt that Platinum did an excellent job of taking advantage and 
getting the most out of the hardware of the Nintendo Switch. I didn't play Bayonetta as much handheld, but that's just because I tend to... I, for action games, my arms move around a lot. My hands are very active. And on a handheld... And for handheld, the handheld console like that, that's not very um, inductive for the type of gameplay the game is trying to do. Game X Machina looks really exciting. Um, it is very visually different from the other Platinum Games worlds they've done. And the n concept of the daemon that you're bonded to, or chained to, looks in looks like it provide, can provide some interesting narrative hooks. I don't know if it's your, like, I wasn't able to find out from coverage if you're just stuck with one for the whole game. Do you get to change daemons if your current daemon dies? Do you, like, snag a new one and then stick with that one for a while? Um, do you collect them? I I really like to see how this actually works out in, in actual game um, execution. Speaking of executions, Doom Eternal. Doom 2018 or 2016 is on my two playlists, on my pile of shame. I suspect if you look really closely on the shelf behind me back there, could probably see the box like right over here, like right up here, more or less, or where Doom is. It's up there on my list. Like my the next kind of two or three games I'm planning on doing for Let's Plays once I finish Super Mario Wars V, uh, Halo Five, some ready for Halo Infinite, Doom. Um, I want to. I want to. Do a PlayStation 2 game. I'm thinking about doing uh doing a beautiful Joe and also a Doom. So there's those. And Doom Eternal, again, it's really, really caught my interest. I like what they're doing with Doom. I like that it's a Doom game that has a story. That both takes itself and doesn't take itself seriously. The chunks, like the, the journals and logs that are there, are serious. Like, they in make clear the stakes of the world you're dealing with. But on the other hand, your character is called the freaking Doomslayer. Um, he has, and he doesn't, he takes no shit from anyone. Um, and when... And like the sense is like, oh, he recognizes that this facility harnessing this demonic energy is bad, and it's, these people are stupid for using this. And he, and when you have Samuel Hayden saying on the PA systems from the, the bits I've seen, cutscene stuff, oh, when you disable this thing, make sure that you be be careful with this. We need to leave this intact so we can set it back up late, so we can restore the power and generation stuff later. Continue generating power from hell basically the response from the from the doom slayer is no fuck that wham and smashes it and you're like and i appreciate that because it is a, it is a sense of it, it gives the doom guy something that he's never really had which is actually his actual sense of character he is spoken of as this mythological figure. He's in this tremendous, he's in a literally apocalyptic situation, fighting demons from hell. Um, but he has, but by how he react, by having him react to the environment, not verbally, but just having him react, smashing stuff by fist bumping the little doom guy bobbleheads, that sort of thing. Um, it gives him a sense of character that he didn't have, and it does it without making him necessarily the type of hackneyed cliche that Duke Nukem is. I mean, yes, Doom Guy is an archetypal space marine, and he expresses himself almost exclusively through violence, but... There is a sense of this character, though he does not speak, understands things about what's really going on and is reacting accordingly based on 
fact that he has a lot of inf- that he already has inherently, though he hasn't expressed it to the player, a lot of information. And I I really appreciate that, and I'm really looking forward to playing in the game and seeing how it all plays out. And after that, kind of there's the two there's the two other titles. Um the ones which had me scratching my head, hemming and hawing, or just straight no no. no. And kind of annoyed me and actively annoying me. The one that annoyed me was police stories. I saw the title, saw the art for the trailer, like, oh, okay. What we're doing it like I was hoping it would be is that this would be a game. It was, it was a police officers, pixel art, and title of police stories. And the thought I had was, huh, I wonder if they're doing something which hasn't been done necessarily in the indie game scene for a while, which is like we, we've gotten pastiches and homages and re- redone versions of various adventure games. Um, like you have like these various cyberpunk um, pixel art adventure games very much done in homage to Snatcher and Police Knots and that sort of thing. You have the nearest LucasArts homage adventure games. And the thought I had was, huh, I wonder if this is doing something similar to doing, like similar to the, all of that, but maybe done in homage to the to the Sierra Online Police Quest games. If you're not familiar with those, Police Quest was a series of adventure games that were police procedurals made by Sierra Online. And they're like, think of them as pixel art prototype um, L.A. Noir. With a little more emphasis to procedure, in some cases to absurd degrees. Like if you don't do a pre-drive um, walk around for your car um, as per procedure before you drive off the uh, out of the lot, your car will like collapse and fall apart and get game over or it'll blow up or that sort of thing. If you do the walk around, it's not that you'll detect the bomb and deal with it accordingly. It's not just your car will de- will operate normally. There was no bomb if you do the, do the walk around. And I'd like to see a game, let's see a game which doesn't get that granular or that punishing, and doesn't necessarily have the Sierra Online obsession with inserting a myriad number of deaths in there to force both to force you to reload and also to encourage the player to collect all your, the all the possible ways you can die um but is taking basically what we've learned over the past 20 more years of game design since the um when Sierra stopped making adventure games and apply that to a to a uh police quest style mystery adventure game and do something interesting with that. And then we get into the meat of the trailer and it's Hotline Miami. We're not actually Hotline Miami. It's it's a Hotline Miami clone. And yes, the trailer implies that you have rules of engagement to follow as opposed to Hotline Miami where it's kill everything that moves. But still, it's like, man, really? Like, we've got a ton of problems, of protests and stuff already going on about militarization of police departments and police departments and police officers going to lethal force too quickly. Read the room, guys! Admittedly, maybe these guys are, like, very much of the pro-military, we will make this game very much of the pro law enforcement militarization side of things. But still, it, I got that moment, like, with the... It's not quite as bad as, like, the Blackwater uh, light gun game that they made back in the day. But it's one of those moments of, like, guys, come on. The other one was uh, Watch Dogs Legion. I recently just beat Watch Dogs 2. I will tr- By the time this video goes up, I will either have a review of Watch... A pro's review of Watch Dogs 2 up on the blog or will be coming up the weekend following. And the thing with Watch Dogs 2 that I liked, and I liked more than Watch Dogs 1, the original one, is the characters in the game were very fleshed out. They had a very strong connection and rapport with each other. 
and which worked out incredibly well when it came to the executions of the game's story, and also had very pointed character beats that sat at really well poked fun at elements of Silicon Valley society, of the of tech sector culture, and that sort of thing. A classic example, which was brought up on uh, Giant Bomb when they were doing the Game of the Year deliberations that year, was when you go when you go to the offices of not Google, uh, your protagonist, if you're not familiar with Watch Dogs 2, is black, and you're going there with a, another member of DedSec who's also black, and who's kind of infiltrated Noodle, within their version of Google. And they're talking, he's going in, like, yeah, I'm, like, there are, like, only two black people here, not including you. Um, like, and we got a, like we have our own mailing list as the only two black people in in the company, and there's like thousands of people here, not hundreds of thousands. Um, and they, that's a beat where the thing with Watch Dogs Legion is it's a game with permadeath and with procedurally generated party members, or procedurally generated members of Dead Sec to be recruiting over the course of the game and using to uh, staff back up when your party members die. When you do this, when you're having your procedurally generated characters like this, with permadeath and having to go hunt or to re-recruit and re-replace new members, you're... you are generally losing the opportunities for those moments, particularly since also you're not... With Watch Dogs 2, you had your hacker spaces, like your main hacker space, where your four, your, your big four members of DedSec are, and you can hang out there, chat with your fellow party, with your fellow members of DedSec, um, and have build up a sense of charisma with each other. And the game doesn't, do, and from what we've seen of Watch Dogs Legion, you don't have these moments. These characters almost deliberately are not having much face-to-face -face contact. Everyone's kind of working, operating separately until on rare occasions they're not. So a lot of that narrative potential is gone. And that, I think, is a major strike against Watch Dogs Legion. The permadeath thing, I'm not the biggest fan of permadeath in the first place. I'm hoping that Ubisoft has it set up in there where if you want a more casual level of difficulty, if you want a more laid back, less high stress level of difficulty, if you want a level of difficulty where you can where you have can comfortably experiment with solving quests, uh, that uh, to like try different approaches and potentially get killed in the process and not have too much skin off your nose, then I would hope that they have the option to turn permadeath off. We'll see. Um, but currently, I'm not too engaged and too super into Watch Dogs League. That's 10 games for me, 3. 2019. What games from this past year that I, that I didn't mention caught your attention? Post those in the comments below. Until next time, I will catch you later. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like sub and subscribe and click the little bell button to be notified whenever new episodes show up on my channel. If you really like the show, please consider backing it on Patreon. Backers will get their name in the credits and at higher levels you get episodes up to one week early and at even higher levels you can select what games that I do for my future Let's Plays. You can find my Patreon at patreon.com slash count zero O-R.